As I record this introduction to the latest episode of The Political Conversation, we have only a handful of days before the presidential election on November the 5th. Everyone expects the election to be a real squeaker with Kamala Harris and Donald Trump separated by a couple percentage points at most. And it's also become clear that the Democrats could lose control of both the House and the Senate. The frustration of Democrats like myself is something you can feel. It is physical. So why, when I rival Donald Trump as a man with no shred of common decency, are we struggling to scratch out a 1% victory? My guest today, Timothy Schenck, has just written his take on that question and on the current state of the Democratic Party. His new book, Left Adrift, What Happened to Liberal Politics, is as provocative as its title. Schenck is a brilliant young assistant professor of history at George Washington University, and for years he was co-editor of Dissent Magazine, which for three generations has been the premier forum where the American left goes to think. It is both deliberately intellectual and earnestly political. In a few days, we'll know the results of the election. But regardless of whether the Democrats or Republicans win, it's high time for us Democrats to ask ourselves this question. Why have we been incapable of winning big since 1964? Most of you listening to this podcast have never experienced a real Democratic victory, a big Democratic victory. You probably assume that winning an election means only that we narrowly win the presidency and are permitted to stagger through four years, trying and frequently failing to win narrow votes in Congress. You've known nothing else. Timothy Schenck thinks he knows a big part of the answer to why we cannot win big. And in the course of explaining his thinking, Schenck takes on several conventional wisdoms that he thinks have shackled our party. So let's get into it. Timothy Shank, welcome to The Political Conversation. Uh, thanks for having me, Wally. So let me ask you just first of all, what was your purpose in writing Left Adrift? The purpose of writing Left Adrift was partly just to scratch an itch I had when I stumbled on two subjects, uh, Stan Greenberg and Doug Schoen, who I had only the smallest awareness of as a political historian in the United States who spends a lot of my free time thinking about contemporary American politics, Greenberg and Schoen, two Democrat consultants, kind of thought I would have been vaguely aware of them if they mattered, or especially aware of them if they were interesting. Turned out that they mattered quite a lot and they were even more interesting. And that by taking a closer look at their careers, it led me into a much larger argument about this shaping the Democratic Party. And once I had that argument in my head, I basically couldn't rest until I got it out in book form. So there's another aspect of your book that I found very intriguing, and that is, it's not all about American politics. Uh, explain your motivation in delving into the politics of South Africa, of Israel, and of uh, the United Kingdom. All right, so some background here. Greenberg and Schoen, not known widely outside of the Democratic political class, but their two partners, uh, Stan Greenberg and James Carville in the first instance, Doug Schoen and Mark Penn. Carville and Penn, very well known. And both of them rose to prominence in the 1990s as advisors to Bill Clinton during his two campaigns. So Greenberg and Carville are there at Clinton's side throughout 1992. Penn and Schoen replaced them alongside Dick Morris in 1996. And the thing about running a major presidential campaign, especially a winning presidential campaign in the United States in the 1990s is if you do it, then the morning of the election, or more likely the morning after, your phone is going to be ringing off the hook with calls from clients around the world saying, do what you just did, but for me. And both Greenberg Carvel and Penn Schoen turned themselves not just into favorite consultants of the Clintons and the Democratic Party, but of advisors to a whole roster of candidates from around the world. So partly this was just interesting story to me, especially since an argument that Carvel and Greenberg and Penn and Schoen ended up having about how to win elections for Democrats after the breakdown of the New Deal coalition. Turns out that this argument wasn't just variations of this argument were happening around the world, because really the core of it is how can center left parties win elections when they can't count on the more or less automatic support of working class voters? And 
center-left parties around the world are facing variations, on-the-ground variations of that problem. And they're turning to a lot, they were turning to a lot of the same people to help them get through that difficulty. Greenberg and Schoen being two of them. So the book traces the origins of their argument, sees how it plays out in the United States, then follows the Greenberg follows Greenberg and Schoen abroad, first with chapter on the United Kingdom, as you mentioned, then with discussion of Israel, then with discussion of South Africa, to see how some similar fights play out in very different circumstances. And the hope here is that I can find a way to do something that's not just a standard historian or journalist account where you take the development of one party or one campaign, one candidate, and follow it over time. But also not what a lot of great political scientists do, which are look at the 60 different countries that I got together, gather data from over 70 years, and I put it all on a map. The origins of politics explained thusly. It's not as tightly focused as a standard historical journalistic account, but it's a little bit more, it's a little bit more comparative, but it's also not as sweeping in its pretensions. It's trying to say, what if we take these ideas seriously and showed how they played out in these very different circumstances? So you understand what's particular about each country and then some general problems that occur along the way too. In addition to just being in my eyes, a really fun story about this grudge between two rival factions of the Democrat consultant class that ended up spilling around the world. Well, I really love the way you uh, created a, a an epigram at the beginning of your book from V.O. Key, who's always been one of my favorite analysts. The perverse and unorthodox argument of this little book is that voters are not fools. So I gather you are labeling your book uh, in the V.O. Key stream. Absolutely. It's a key. It's, it's, it's in the key and tradition or key the tradition. I don't even know exactly what tradition I'm in, but it follows very naturally from Key's insight, in, which he makes in his last book, The Responsible American Electorate, published posthumously, which says at a time when the American voter was being subjected to unprecedented empirical scrutiny by just fleets of political scientists with theories about, oh, it's about political tribalism. It's about partisanship. It's about community. He came along with, as he said, the perverse and unorthodox argument that elections were actually decided by voters who had views about policy. Yes, lots of other factors are at work, but policy is a really important one. People aren't don't spend their time going through campaign platforms, but they have a sense of what matters to them and a sense of where the candidates fall on those issues. And politicians, parties, activists that forget that lesson do so at their peril. And your book, to me... Um definitely is an exploration of two different ways of, of approaching American politics. One is to look at race and to see so much of our politics dominated by that issue ever since, certainly, the Johnson bills in 1964. Um, and the alternative view, which preceded the Johnson civil rights revolution and perhaps is reasserting itself, is class structure as the most important determinant. Um, without stuffing words into your mouth, j give us a taste of where we're headed in the book's discussion. So a starting point, especially since you mentioned the prominence of the interpretation, especially in our circles, Democrat, liberal circles, of the 1964 is the turning point argument. It's the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That's the origin of the breakdown of the Democratic majority. In so many words, why can't Democrats have nice things? Because we sacrificed ourselves at the altar of civil rights. It was this noble act of Johnson where he writes away the South for a generation or so the story goes. One problem with that argument is timing, because the thing about the 1964 Civil Rights Act is that it's passed in 1964, a few months before Johnson wins that landslide victory you were talking about. So if that turn in the Democratic Party was enough to explain what happened, then the timing would have looked a lot different and we might have been thinking about a President Barry Goldwater instead of a great society. All right, so the timing is one part, but the geography is tricky too, because it's just not the case that the United States is the only country where a center-left party has struggled with working-class voters over the last generation, over the last two generations at this point. The United States has an exceptional history of racialized slavery, Jim Crow, white supremacy, and its aftermath. It's an extraordinarily important part of American history, and one that sets us apart from, say, France, Germany, the United Kingdom. 
The thing is that France, Germany, United Kingdom have also struggled with working class voters. So if we are trying to explain, and those are just a few of the countries, this is not a universal phenomenon, but wealthy countries around the world have been facing variations of this challenge, um, which is one reason why they were turning to people like Greenberg and Schoen for advice in the 1990s. And you cannot therefore, I think, explain a international phenomenon with a distinctly national account. For instance, again, the overriding importance of slavery and its aftermath in American history. So while, of course, saying that if we want to understand the migration in the first instance of a lot of white working class voters, especially in the South, from the Democratic Party, and it matters for our story that sometimes people talk about the realignment of working class voters, sometimes they'll talk about the realignment of the South, the South is one of the poorest regions of the country. So in some cases, you're often talking about two of the same things, and especially it's one of the poorest regions of the country in the 1960s when this process begins. But the fact is that it's not limited to the South and that even Nixon's strategists recognized that if the Republican Party with a Southern strategy picked up Mississippi but lost Ohio, that's not a good trade-off in the long run. They have wanted a national majority. I really think when we talk about the Southern strategy, we should think of it more as a Northern strategy, especially in isolating the Northeast strategy against Republicans thought a broader South, Midwest, um, and as much of the West as you could get to alliance, a sort of neo-Jacksonian coalition where race would be one element. Kevin Phillips, author of the Emerging Republican Majority, says explicitly what he describes as the nationalizing of quote unquote the Negro problem kickstarted this transformation in the United States, but it wasn't limited to that. It was also about hippies. It was about the counterculture. It was about Vietnam. It was about family values. The exact axis of conflict changes over time. Immigration, especially outside the, in the United States in recent years, outside the United States, going back to, for instance, the United Kingdom in 1968, while George Wallace is tearing apart the two parties on the campaign trail in his third party bid for president, Enoch Powell, an anti-immigrant Tory in the UK, is winning over a lot of labor voters, a lot of blue collar working class labor voters with thundering denunciations, borderline or outright demagogic denunciations, racist denunciations of uh, immigrants in the United Kingdom. And so, without for a second saying that the backlash to civil rights was not an important factor in this transformation, it just can't be the entirety of the story. Now, whether that means class is the driving factor is a different story. And from my own perspective, as a leftist, I would, and I, to be honest with fans of this podcast, they sort of more or less unreconstructed Bernie crap. You know, that's my guy. Uh, love Bernie. Um, really wish 2016 had played out differently. But another question I was asking was, um, approaching the book as well. Why didn't 2016 and especially 2020 play out differently? If class is an important, crucial, decisive sociological fact, as I believe it is, why are electoral coalitions, not just in the United States, but around the world, so rarely divided along economic lines? How, if I think that the battle against economic inequality is the central challenge of our time, how can you build a political majority that believes that too? Yeah, how? <laughs> Sorry. That was well put. So... Let me just cut to one of the difficult questions I wanted to ask you. You posit that the, uh, the as you just said, that the central issue in your mind uh, is the economic issue, the, the rise of inequality and the, the unfair distribution of all of the goods that an economy can provide in our country, uh, a, a classic class issue. One class is thriving, another class is not. Um, here's, the, here's the thing I wanted to test you on. That could be seen as you saying that the whole host of cultural issues, uh, including racial discrimination, uh, feminism, feminine, uh, women's liberation, um, right on through other cultural issues such as environmentalism and climate change need to take a secondary role to what you see as the primary driver. How, uh, how do you respond to that challenge to your general structure? Well, one is just a point about politics, which is that every majority coalition and in the United States, when we're stuck with a two party system for better and for worse, um, we're going to have to work through majority coalitions that every coalition majority coalition, if it's going to get anything done, has to set priorities. 
And it not consciously setting priorities just means that you're letting someone else dictate the terms for you. And that from my perspective as a historian, when I look at American history over the last 60 years, what I see is a story of enormous cultural progress. When I talk to my students about this, the way I frame it is, in the United States in the early 1960s, my wife, who's um, Indian American, and I, we live in Virginia, our marriage would have been illegal. Our three children would not have been allowed to, ex not have been seen as our sort of legitimate children by in the eyes of the state. Now, around this time, a guy by the name of Barack Hussein Obama is born. Imagine if you could time travel back to, I don't know, a person who is living in my neighborhood in the early 1960s. It's a suburb of Northern Virginia, so probably a Republican at the time. You told that man, that woman, that someone had just been born, this guy, Barack Hussein Obama, who would become the first black president in the United States. And he would appoint the first Latina Supreme Court justice of the United States. And that that Latina Supreme Court justice would be part of a majority that would announce that gay marriage, gay and lesbian marriage was a constitutional, same-sex marriage was a constitutional right. And that this would be sort of the cause of a sort of national celebration and joy, popular support, not inspire the type of backlash that liberal justices on the court ran into time and again in the 1960s. That is an enormous transformation. Does it mean that full cultural equality has been occurred, has occurred across the board? No, of course not, it has not been brought about. But it has taken place at the same time where if you agree with scholarship from folks like Thomas Piketty, economists like Thomas Piketty, that this cultural progress has coincided with a significant retreat from the relative economic egalitarianism, again, not perfect, but better than we have today, the relative economic equality of the United States in the middle of the 20th century. So when I think about the massive cultural gains of the last 60 years and the significant economic losses, especially if you care about economic inequality. And when I think about the people who are most likely to bear the burden of those losses, people disproportionately black, disproportionately Hispanic, often disproportionately transgender, the people who would benefit the most from a broad-based redistribution of economic power in the United States, the kind that you could get with a majority grounded in working and middle-class voters who put that interest, who regularly tell pollsters that these economic issues are at the top of their agenda. Well, it seems to me that you could just do the greatest good for the greatest number by focusing on those issues, issues like jobs, housing, education, healthcare. Because when you ask actually existing, for instance, black and Hispanic people, what matters most to them? Same issues as a lot of working class white voters. They come up again and again and again. And one advantage of the comparative perspective is you see, not just in the United States, this is voters generally. It's jobs, it's housing, it's education, it's healthcare. It's the stuff you need to have a decent life. I value, I consider myself so enormous lucky, enormously lucky to have access to those things in my life. And to the extent that I can be part of a pol political coalition, a political project that brings that to the largest number of people, especially again, those poor working class people who would benefit from them the most. To me, it seems like in a world where you can't get everything, you can get a hell of a lot that way. Well, let me, I, I wanna come back to the way you formulated that and press you on a couple points. But let me take a little, Detour. It may sound like a detour, but I think it, it plays in. Uh, it, All right, I'll walk with you then. <laughs> All right. So several times in your book, you use the phrase, uh, today's crisis of democracy. And with all due respect, I didn't see it spelled out uh, bluntly enough for a guy like me to be absolutely confident of what you precisely see as the crisis of democracy. Uh, is the failure of the Democratic Party to et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or is there something else that you're alluding to? Well, I mean, partly it's kind of a little known fact, but there's this kind of obscure fellow by the name of Donald Trump. And I don't know if you followed him recently, but he's been up to just a lot of shenanigans. And some of those shenanigans include trying to steal an election in plain sight. And anytime you have the head of a major party in an outright war with uh, sort of the constitutionally legitimate verified results of an election, to me, that's a big warning sign. But it's not the only one. I think that the Republican Party has some unique and severe pathologies, but it doesn't mean I'm giving the Democratic Party a clean bill of health. Voters, ordinary Americans for about 20 years at this point have been saying by pretty significant numbers, like on the order of 60%, 
that the country is going on the wrong track. And when you consider, especially the toll for working class people, the opening up of a gap in life expectancy, for instance, between college graduates and non-college graduates, I'm not saying that the United States is a nightmare dystopia. I'm not saying that there's a populist spirit that's instantly available, ready to be channeled by the left. Um, if that is, then Bernie really would have won in 2016 and in 2020. And we wouldn't, Americans wouldn't have this funny habit of perennially reelecting incumbents, including Republican governors in bluish or purple and bluish or purple states, but that there are serious ways in which a governing class, a political elite that's done awfully well for itself in recent years has detached itself from the rest of the country. So I think that there is a particular problem that we face with a Trumpified populist GOP, populist in the worst sense of the term, in the so populist that in fact they don't want to bother with elections anymore, at least it can seem that way in the most extreme cases. And then a broader sense of a lot of ordinary Americans that the system has stopped working for them. And I think that they're not wrong about that. And that, you know, whenever you're writing a book, you're aware that you're writing it for a small, over only college educated audience, in this case, a book about the left that's more or less for the left. I want us to think about our own responsibility in this situation. And while agreeing with everyone on our side that the sort of bad orange guy is in fact really bad and really orange, that we need to do more to address the problem ourselves. So uh, it, it does sound like you're urging the Democratic Party to stop building itself around cultural issues, broadly defined to include environmental issues, but and rather to center the party on the economic issues that you see as the, the crucial, the crucial ones. Well, I think that this is where me as historian, especially a historian who was saying I got into this book because I stumbled on a story about the making of the Democrat coalition that I just didn't have in my head. One where people who I'd written off in my mind as just sort of the neoliberal tribunes of a suburbanized Democratic Party that didn't care about class politics like Bill Clinton, that and strategists like Greenberg, strategists like Penn and Schoen. In fact, these figures were intensely aware of the question of blue collar voters and of trying to win them over for the Democratic Party while also making inroads in suburbia, that these folks were a lot smarter than I thought they were. And that I think that my ignorance wasn't just a reflection of my own failures, but a kind of condescension that a lot of young millennial and Zoomer leftists have toward that cohort of Democratic politicians. Condescension that I think in some sense was justified by the disaster of 2016, but that I think shouldn't lead directly to writing off everything that they were doing. The book is in part my effort to say, here's what I think is really valuable, what we should learn from that group. When one thing I think we learn from them is take voters seriously, work hard to understand what they believe. And that means not coming in with your own set of preconceived biases about what's going on there. So while I believe that those questions about jobs, education, housing, healthcare, most of the time are pretty high up on ordinary voters lists, it's also true that in 2022, abortion rights were arguably the biggest issue for Democrats. And to the extent that I believe that the party should be more responsive to the concerns of working class voters than it already is, that means not coming in assuming that inevitably it's going to be the same set of economic issues or that inevitably the answers to those economic problems would be one that me, Bernie Kratt leftist, would like there to be. So the fact if Democrats can mobilize working class voters by leaning hard on abortion rights, which I think they can to a degree, then go for it. But I think that treating cultural issues alone as a way to get the job done, as the Hillary Clinton campaign too often leaned into in 2016, is a way to torch the party standing, or at least to further erode it with a lot of working class voters. And that to me seems like it's both bad, bad politics and bad policy. Well, I, uh, I, I'm going to preface the, this line of questioning with, by saying that you and I see things very much the same. We, the priorities that, that you personally have for the party pretty much match the perspective I personally have. And if you think there's a but coming, there is a but coming. Uh, and the but is um, there's a real difference, I believe, between the cultural, let's just call them cultural issues. I know that's not fair in some ways, but I need a label. Uh, it's a good enough one. I agree. I, similarly, I don't endorse it wholeheartedly, but it's there is still at the end of the day a difference between capital gains taxes and flag pins or whatever you want to put in the list. Yeah. So 
the, the difference I see is this. Um, cultural rights are about good and evil. Uh, discrimination, I mean, the classic example, true, the classic example, American discrimination against black Americans. That is a case of good and evil. Um, and out of that grew movement after movement after movement, which said, yes, and discrimination against me, uh, discrimination against Latinos, discrimination against women. Discri- it's on and on. So, but it's always about the struggle of good against evil. And the difficulty there is politics so much of the time is about compromise. How do you say to people who are thinking of politics as a struggle between good and evil, my compromise is a good compromise as opposed to you're compromising with the evil side. And so, so here's the difficulty for people like you and me on the, on the economic issues. To talk about economic issues means you are inherently vulnerable to the accusation that you are pulling the plug on a real struggle against real evil of one sort or another. The moral context of the two sets of issues is entirely different. And so, so, I, so I guess what I'm saying is, it may be harder than we think already to achieve the the unification of the party we'd like to do. And I think that the moral rush from taking on a struggle on behalf of marginalized groups, this is not just a, it's not, it's not to be dismissed lightly. Uh, there's an anecdote I didn't include in the book. Uh, it comes from uh, South Africa, uh, one of uh, figure uh, R. W. Johnson, who's a professor at Oxford, long term professor at Oxford. He was Doug Schoen's uh, PhD supervisor there. He actually grew up in South Africa and returned after the end of apartheid. And Johnson discusses meeting another sort of anti-apartheid activist when he was there and saying that you know politics now this is in a sense it's what I always dreamed of after apartheid, but it never feels as sort of pure as the struggle was. And I think that for a lot of Americans, a lot of white Americans in particular who were in the Freedom Summer Rides in the 1960s and who participated firsthand in the battle against Jim Crow, there's a sense that the struggle then will never be as sort of pure as it's been and that a lot of the progressive activist class, you know, they might actually be kind of sad when Donald Trump is gone because it removes the sort of clarity of the, the moral clarity of the campaign against Trump, which for a lot of people has taken up a significant amount of their emotional bandwidth. But I also think about the story of Sam Greenberg going to work on Nelson Mandela's first uh, campaign, really the sort of ANC, Mandela's party, the first post-apartheid campaign in South African history, the first with this um, race neutral, sort of an opening up of the suffrage after decades of white supremacy. And what Greenberg found is that a lot of folks within the ANC, it came down essentially to a battle of the slogans. And there was a strong contingent of ANC activists who had cut their teeth in the battle against apartheid who said, you know the slogan we want, it's now is the time. Because they implicitly, it's a declaration of victory in the battle against white supremacy, saying now is the time for our struggle to go to its next phase. It's the culmination of this long effort. And what Greenberg found is that when he looked at focus groups with voters, when he tested this out in practice, that a lot of ordinary people, like, they they like that fine. But victory for the ANC wasn't, sorry, a declaring victory for the ANC, that wasn't their top concern. They were concerned about violence. They were concerned about crime. They were concerned about running water. They were concerned about unemployment. The South African version of the same questions that I've been talking about in the American context so far. And the slogan that they actually liked was a better life for all which is a forward-looking one that focused not on what the ANC had achieved against apartheid, but about what the government could do for them now, what the government could do to improve their lives. The tragedy of the ANC is that it hasn't delivered in crucial respects for many South Africans, including many Black South Africans, which is why in the elections this year, the party lost its majority hold in Congress for the first time in its history. Uh, But that insight that even in South Africa, even in the immediate aftermath of the collapse of apartheid, running on a moral victory detached from the everyday concerns of voters wasn't going to get the job done. 
To me, that's a lesson. And it's a lesson that says that activists, while we have long-term goals that we want to bring the rest of the country toward, well, this is a work of persuasion. And persuasion is a lot easier when you take seriously the folks on the other side, the people you're trying to persuade, recognize that they have views of their own, that they didn't just arrive at haphazardly, that they care about and that need to be taken seriously. And that there has to inevitably mean a compromise of your own position as an activist, where if you really want to change the world, as I think you should, well, then think seriously about how you're going to get that done. And, you know, Saul Alinsky used to say that there are two kinds of power. There's organized money and there's organized people. Now, there will be some progressive causes that can get organized money on their side. But the type of stuff we're talking about, never going to get organized money, which means you got to get organized people, which means that majoritarian coalition politics is the name of the game. It's not going to give us everything we want, but it's the best of the limited options that we have. And if you want, if you're going to recognize that you have to play the game, you might as well do it well. So I, I, I have to pause here and ask a, a, an absurdly technical question. Are you familiar with the work of Morris Fiorina? A little bit. Yes, yes, yes. The is he's what? Give me the book. I recognize the name from. Sort oh of lord, the, oh lord. Um, uh, Culture Wars. Um, uh, the I, I'm sorry, blanking on his latest book, but Culture Wars was a yes. a big one in which he took the myth of the, a polarized America, right? The myth of a polarized America and. He argues strongly that it is vastly overstated and, and used for ill effect. I'm yeah, hearing... much more of an elite phenomenon than a mass one. And this goes back to, I am, so my political orientation, I already said drop Bernie Sanders, but really a key part of it too is guy who was very, very excited about Barack Obama in 2008 and was also, also there for Occupy Wall Street and to, in the, like later on in uh, 2011. And that one of my... A political memory that will stay with me until the day I die is being in college, watching Barack Obama give, acceptance spe uh, give it the keynote address at the 2004 Democratic Convention, saying that there's no red America, there's no blue America. And having written about Obama before, I feel confident saying that that was not a naive post-partisan declaration of ooey-gooey national sentiment from someone who was blind to all the cultural divisions in American life. No, that was a strategic case by someone who knew the costs of political, political polarization for the type of people he worked with on the south side of Chicago, overwhelmingly poor, overwhelmingly black in the 1980s. Obama then knew that leaning into the polarized culture war, it wasn't just a bad set of strategies for Democrats trying to build a national majority. It was never going to help the people who he came into public life to work with and to benefit. And whatever critiques I have of Obama, and there are a few, I think that that initial insight and initial impulse is extraordinarily admirable. And the 2004 speech should be viewed as his first campaign speech in his presidential campaign. Yeah. I know I basically signed up that night. Yep. So let me, I, I've been challenging and challenging, and I, I'm coming back to another challenge, which is um, more difficult. And frankly, I, I don't have the ability at this moment, maybe I could dig it up, to give you statistics that will back what I'm going to say. But I'm going to say it just right out. The, the, the vision you see is that the Democratic Party will unify the cultural warriors and the economic warriors, the, 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 the folks very much concerned with the decline of American middle class from an economic perspective and folks who are motivated primarily by cultural issues. Bring those folks together and you have a much more, a much larger democratic party, a party that can roll on to victory after victory after victory. But here's my worry, and, and I have a number of worries about this thing. The differences that exist between those two groups are not simply issue after issue after issue. I believe this, you believe that. I think this, you think that. It goes beyond that. And it has, it goes down to the level of despising each other. So I come from uh, an intellectual background, college degrees, legal degrees. Um, I fit the profile of a, a progressive left democratic person. Um, in my world, it is socially acceptable to say things about working people that would never be accepted 
as words that could be said about black Americans, Latino Americans, um, women. Um, and when I hear that, it appalls me because it says to me the, the potential of bringing folks together is not simply a matter of compromising on issues. There's a cultural difference which we really need to take seriously. And on the working class, and now, now my class, by the way, I would add, never admits that that's going on because, of course, they would never look down on other people. That is beneath me to ever look down on anyone else. I am wonderful. Um, for working class folks, it is very evident, and Donald Trump is one of the final proofs of this, that they have no problem whatsoever <laughs> in saying that they despise the overeducated, pompous, you know, scions of the political left. To achieve the larger Democratic Party that you and I would like to achieve, we're going to have to figure out a way to draw together. And what I'm saying is it's not just a matter of figuring out the compromises on the issues. There's some personal stuff that's going to have to be worked out. Yeah, and the advantage that we have, though, and this is sort of me as class trader uh, speaking here, or at least class persuader speaking here, is that we have the, uh, the ability to call the bluff of our side and to say, if we are, in fact, as enlightened and tolerant and tolerant as we say we are, so take advantage of the fact that this kind of snobbery that you're referring to is, is frowned upon officially, even if people practices, practice it in reality all the time. But that's an advantage to say that our actions don't accord with our ideals and that if we are so smart, if we are so enlightened so, and so tolerant, then let's match up our beliefs with our practices and recognize that educated progressives can be part of a coalition. We get to be on the bus, but we don't get to, we don't get to drive the bus. There's just not enough of us. And there's this ideal, part of the reason why I believe this is just because it has been my own journey. Uh, so after 2016, trying to figure out why I didn't understand American politics nearly as well as I did, this book is one consequence of that. And thinking that you know, if we are in this crisis of democracy, what's the solution? I think it's more democracy. And I think that includes taking democracy seriously, not as democracy means that all this stuff that I, as a lefty college professor, would like to see out in the world. No, no, it's not that substantive vision. It can be. I can work toward that. But democracy in the first instance is a system for translating public opinion into public policy, for allowing majorities of ordinary people to feel as if their views are being heard because they are, in fact, being heard and taken seriously by people with governing power. And that it's up to us progressive activists to figure out how to align our views and our policy, the policies we care about with those majority coalitions over the short term. And then over the longer term to pursue the type of transformative change that we see, for instance, in the case of gay rights over the last generation, the revolution in LGBT rights that's taken place in my lifetime. If we can have that type of progress, one that importantly occurs chiefly in the cultural realm and then is ratified in the political realm, pointing to the fact that even if majorities are good for some issues, even if electoral politics is good for big structural reforms involving the redistribution of wealth, well, again, another reason why not to automatically assume that every issue on the progressive agenda needs to be filtered through electoral politics. It's taking the case of LGBT rights and seeing what happens when politics comes relatively late in the process comparatively and seeing that, in fact, progressives, you know, we have these beliefs about egalitarianism that we can appeal to. We also, when we want to be, can be really deft at fighting the culture wars. One lesson that the right has learned time and again is that victory in electoral politics, to their frustration, does not translate into victory in the culture war in the way that they would like to see. Well, take advantage of our strength as culture warriors who do, in fact, run Hollywood and the media and all the rest and present compelling visions, not just through politicians, but through the movies, the music, the whatever social media accounts that people are following. Fight this war on every front, but pick your battles to match the weapons that actually work in the field at hand. I'm toying with, the, with sharing a, a something I lived through, which... Uh, stuck with me, and it may be why I obsess on the difficulty of bringing folks together. I was in the California State Legislature for a number of years, and I worked uh, in the legislature to raise the profile of the issue of the American middle class and did a variety of things to that end. 
Um, I vividly remember we had a meeting of the Democratic Caucus where all of the Democrats in the legislature get together to talk. And I was screamed at by a prominent Democratic leader who I won't name, uh, but you can guess uh, who it was that the effing middle class can effing well take care of its effing self. We're Democrats. We're for the poor. We're for the blind. We're for the hungry and the effing middle class. Da 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 da. Um, and that moment has stuck with me. Uh, I can't imagine why <laughs> for, for years and years and years. Um, we're gonna we're gonna run into that again and again and again as as we move forward and try to create this this reconciliation. But I am optimistic also. Let me not be just completely pessimistic. Let's talk a bit about the election we're currently involved in. And I'd like to get your assessment of where this is really, because this is called, this is journalism becoming history instantly. Where do you see Kamala Harris fitting into the debate and the structure that you've been sketching? So on the one hand, if you were just to look at pure biography, you would see Harris as the person cooked up in a lab by Progressive Activism, Inc. to sort of satisfy, to check every box in the Democratic wish list. And therefore, you might assume that, especially if you're concerned about alienating white blue collar voters, that you could not pick a worse person than the biracial San Francisco liberal run down the list. On the other hand, what you see is that divide between the way a sort of caricature of a progressive activist would see things and the way that her consultants, who I think really speak for the sort of conventional wisdom inside the Democratic political class right now, are approaching things, where it's the Harris who has more or less junked her 2019. I was, I, there was a moment I was writing a piece about Harris's first presidential run, and I referred to her 2020 presidential campaign, and I realized that was incorrect because it was so misbegotten that she didn't actually make it into 2020. She quit uh, at the tail end of 2019. But it's a race to get Harris in line with on key issues of what her campaign at least sees uh, public opinion moving toward today. And it is not a Harris who's telling the middle class to F themselves. It is a Harris who is telling the middle class that she is a child of the middle class and she is with them and that she's going to be on their side in a way that Donald Trump will never be. You see a lot of elements of a kind of strategy that I'm very sympathetic to at work here. On the other hand, I think you also see that in the absence, not just of saying the right things a few times, but having a coherent message that drives those points home again and again and has a handful of concrete policies that make the sort of salience of those economic issues in particular stand out, that tell voters in a world where Harris is going to have, a President Harris would have a billion different demands on her attention. Here are the things she's really, she really cares about, and here's how that makes a difference in your life. Well, without that clear countervailing message, you really get more of a default to vibes. You get a sense that, oh, Kamala is brat. She's the one that people like on TikTok, like Tim Wallace, he's adorable. And it's and Donald Trump is a menace to democracy. And there are some issues where while Harris often stumbles to talk about economics, she has a clear, crisp, strong voice on issues like abortion rights. And you kind there's a war going on between a strategist class that knows what it should be saying to win elections and both what a broad progressive culture and Harris herself, just because of her specific strengths and weaknesses as a politician, managed to convey. And what you see here, the results are still unclear. There's some evidence that Harris has done. There's a good amount of evidence that Harris has done a lot to reverse Biden's declines with especially black voters to a lesser extent, but not unimportantly, Hispanic voters as well. There's also some extent that the bleeding with white working class, white non-college voters might be even greater than it had been before. It'll take a while for this to sort out. But on the one hand, I'm comforted to see that, or at least I take heart that strategists inside the Democratic Party are not stuck in 2016 trying to win the election through the culture war. On the other hand, the absence of a really compelling and coherent alternative means that I think those gestures aren't nearly as effective as they could be. Well, part of that may be uh, the failure of the left broadly defined to have defined um, what a, a real economic agenda would look like. We've inter I've interviewed a bunch of folks on, on the left. Danny Roderick is one of my favorite economists along those lines. 
talking about industrial policy, but even with people like Roderick uh, and others who have fleshed things out in great detail, it has yet to become fully integrated into the perspective of the Democratic Party. It's, it's words that appear in speeches and then appear in some pieces of legislation, but I doubt that the party has fully integrated those kinds of ideas into, into, into its fiber. Um, so we have a ways to, we have a ways to go on that. I, I don't lay it at all at the politicians feet. I think intellectuals need to take up that task very seriously as well. It's also hard to do though, when the democratic donor class is lean so heavily on the support of financial interests from Silicon Valley to wall street, venture capital, uh, hedge funds, consultants. I was just seeing just sort of some really jaw-dropping numbers on sort of the Harris campaign success at raising from that top, not just 1%, but top 0.0001% in the last few months. Like she is on the one hand, a sort of phenomenon with that top 10% of politically active donors, but with the sort of mega donors who really sort of call the shots, just sure. sort of extraordinary, extraordinary support. And a Democratic Party coalition, what I worry about is that even though in important ways, the Democratic platform, Democratic policy has shifted left since the Clinton years, that the combination of losing ground with working class voters, a story that has become increasingly a multiracial story in recent years, not just a white working class voter story, that combined with the dependence on a tiny number of enormously wealthy interests, that just means that it's going to be hard to make credible promises about policy change that tilts the balances of power and income toward working people. I, I, I have been pessimistic and pessimistic and pessimistic and cautionary and cautionary and cautionary, and I hate doing that. <laughs> so let me point out something about the Harris campaign that uh, makes me think that it isn't just her consultants that are uh, assisting a change in point of view, and that is how she is addressing the Latino electorate in particular. Uh, we went through an era in democratic politics where consultant candidates and uh, Democrats in the trenches all agreed they knew how to talk to the Latino electorate. And the way you did that was uh, to pledge open borders, to pledge immigration en masse, to do this and to do that, to talk all about, it's all about immigration. Um, it's all about uh, opening things up. Um, and it's best if you do that in Espanol. Um, and Harris has been following a very different line that was outlined by a, a recent guest on the podcast, Mike Madrid, uh, a Republican political consultant who is one of the leaders of the anti-MAGA movement, um, a, a man who decided Donald Trump simply had to go, and whether he was Republican or not, uh, Madrid was going to pitch in. Madrid argues strongly that uh, very much sounds like Timothy Schenck. Uh, Latina voters care about, guess what Latina voters care about? They care about housing. They care about work profoundly. It's an enormously important thing to the Latino electorate. Good Lord, what brought a hundred million, what, what brings hundreds of millions of people to the United States? The desire for work. Um, work, housing, health care, bread and butter, health care issues. And uh, I've noticed in her rhetoric that uh, Harris has emphasized those issues and has coupled that with a few striking cases of hardening a line on immigration issues. Um, and I've noticed that progressives have been very discontent with that hardened line, but they've ignored the fact that uh, Harris is uh, appealing to Latino electorate as if as V.O. Key would say, they're not fools. Yeah. And this is just a case where progressives, and I count myself among them, there is, do I have a strong and profound moral commitment to a world of borders? Like, no. Do I see, would I love to live in a world where we would not need to rely on those sort of coercive measures of keeping people out of our country? Like, yes, I would. But that's not the world that most people in our country want to live in. And we have an obligation to respect that. Again, there's a line from Stan Greenberg. Uh, people live in a, People think they live in democracy and they live in a democracy and they want that to be taken seriously. And I can understand 
the even if from an abstract the abstract perspective of global justice that there's no single thing you could do more to increase global net welfare than taking people from incredibly poor countries and moving them to the United States well if that's going to come out of the pocket of people in the United States our fellow citizens we have an obligation to them too and a line that's been attributed to various figures um, if liberals don't enforce the border then fascists will I take that seriously and the saving grace I see here is like, on the one hand, that public opinion has changed so rapidly on the issue, it's moved right so quickly. But the fact that it's moved right so quickly tells me that it can move back in a more progressive direction, if people feel like their concerns about the border are being met. And that those concerns, it's not a case of either we have maximal openness and global justice, or this dystopian Trumpian nightmare state, that most people there is this is me sounding a bit like the 2004 Barack Obama, that it's not an either or case, it's a both and, and that there's a majority in the country that believes both that there should be order at the border, that there should be a policy, a coherent policy that's being followed, but that is opposed to mass deportation camps. And that you drive people, to, and this is a key argument uh, in activist circles always, there's a fear among activists that if you concede a point to the other side, then you just shift the debate in the direction. I just don't buy it. I think that gives us too much power over the discourse. I think if you concede, if you move closer to the center to where voters are, then there are voters who are gonna appreciate that and say, okay, I'm more likely to come over to you. I'm less likely to be driven to the opposite extreme. Just as I think that it would be terrible politics for Republicans to run on a campaign against IVF and for, uh, pro-life with no exceptions policy. I don't think, in fact, that that would move a chunk of the electorate in a more pro-life direction. I think that would just make a lot of swing voters think that Republicans are crazy. Well, I think the policies of immigration work pretty similarly. Unfortunately, it's not in the side that I would like them to. But I think that, again, that saving grace is that people, opinion moves on these issues. It moves toward an extreme when they feel that their views aren't being heard and they're being forced in that direction. If liberals, progressive Democrats, can offer a better alternative, people will meet us there. This is a case where virtue won't, in fact, go unrewarded. Well, it's a pleasure to meet an optimist. Happy to play the part. No, it's a, I know it's wonderful to meet an optimist. I, I thank you for that. Um, there's lots of cynicism before you get to it, but I feel like too often people, there's a radical, there's an optimism about the potential world that could be created with almost a cynicism that the country we live in could actually support it, or with just a question mark, question mark, question mark strategy for how we get there. And I think an optimism that's grounded on a realistic expectation of what we can expect from people, that's one that can sustain you when the fighting gets hard. And a healthy cynicism can sharpen the edge of the tools that the liberal optimist would use. It's, uh, it's, it can be useful. It can be useful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the book is Left Adrift by Timothy Schenk. Um, it is part of the Global Columbia Global Reports, and it has that title, I presume, because of its detailed discussion of the politics of three nations other than the United States, but placing the United States politics in a global context for a very specific reason. And that is to say, it isn't, <laughs> all of our issues are not dominating worldwide. Uh, thank you so much for coming on The Political Conversation. Uh, thank you for having me, Wally.